action. Hey everybody, welcome back to All Talk uh, with me, your host Mike All. Thanks again for uh, joining in, watching. Uh, I've got a, a, a really great guest tonight. Um, not only is he really funny, he's really one of the uh, good producers in the Chicagoland area. Uh, he puts on really good shows. We'll get into that a lot. Uh, he's a, a successful businessman, a successful visitor, business owner, and uh, a great producer. Funnier by the lake. Please welcome Larry Bloom. Go on, Larry. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Thanks for having Good. me. Definitely. Glad you're here. Uh, anything I left out of your intro that you want to throw in there? Any more superlative? To, uh, uh, I, can give, I can just give you my boilerplate introduction if you want. You want me yeah, to do let's that? Do it. It takes, it takes about 20 that. seconds. Uh, my name is Larry Bloom. I run Funnier by the Lake Comedy in Highland Park, Illinois. What we do is we produce a lot of uh, comedy shows, uh, dinners and shows, and straight up stand up comedy showcases and uh, private events. And we also do uh, comedy related services for businesses like, like, uh, like speeches and presentations and uh, auctioneering and facilitating uh, meetings and events. Uh, and all could be found at funnierbythelake.com or funnierbythelake on Instagram and Facebook. Nice, awesome. One of, one of the things that I always like to point out when, uh, when I'm talking about Larry, whether it be with another comedian, another producer or whatnot, one of the things that impresses me the most about you that you've been doing for a long time before it was mm -hmm. cool or the right thing to do by any means is as far as I've, as long as I've known you, which is going back several years now, you've always produced one of the most diverse shows and it's always equal 50, 50 female, male, uh, transgender, whatever. You're always, you, you were way ahead of the curve and I was, want to give you props for that because that, well, that was really cool i always aim for 50 50 at least sometimes it didn't doesn't work out so if you see a funnier by lake show and you see the lineup and it's got like because there's usually four people on the lineup so if it ends up being like three guys and one uh woman or uh or all guys or whatever that usually means that uh somebody dropped out <laughs> you know right <laughs> and so and i had to get someone quick and i, I usually try and replace like a, a guy with a guy or a woman with a woman but sometimes it doesn't work out if you're in a pinch. But otherwise, I and you know, I, I and anyone who I co-produce with, I I I, uh, I I drill that in as well. Like that's part of the brand of Funnier by the Lake is to have that yeah. that, that that parody of um, uh, of of lineups. That's uh, first of all. I, I just think uh, uh, my joke is that you know because I'm a feminist uh, and I loves the ladies. You know. That's, yeah. <laughs> no, but I I just. First of all, I just think uh, I, that was something that I, I discovered, like uh, women I would do comedy with, they would kind of complain about that. And I would always feel weird when I'd just be on some show and it'd be like seven guys and, and one yeah. woman and they'd get introduced as like, our next comedian is a lady comic, and, you know? So I, I, you know, and again, and then I never really understood, uh, especially in this day and age, there's just so many funny women. I, I right. have no problem, I got a whole, endless list of, of guys and women who, who you know who I, I look to the book and new people that I meet all the time and there's no there's no shortage of that uh, it was a lot easier to book it when there were only two genders though now it's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry difficult. I can't represent every every uh, you go, you I, can't actually I can't represent a, everyone just but you actually book a vegan show too with Laura Hogg right uh, Are you I used to I started well she she was asked to do it for the venue wanted to okay. do comedy. Uh, and then uh, uh, she had done a lot of my shows and she asked me to uh, help her with it basically, just okay. uh, just how to, how to pull it together and how to market it. And also how to um, uh, originally just even uh, bef before she met with the venue, uh, just sort of figure, you know, just, just figure out how to negotiate that yeah. as far as, uh, uh, um, getting paid to do the show and all and everything like that and 
And, and so, and I did that for, with her, I think from June to December, and then she just took it over on her own. Um, she didn't really need yeah. me anymore. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but uh, we did the first six together and then, and then now I'm like a, you know, occasional, if I'm free, I'll come and I'll watch or I'll do a guest spot. Yeah. Which is nice. That's cool. So one of the questions I've always wanted to ask you that I, I, I'm glad I thought about it as we're sitting here talking, you do a lot of stuff in the northern suburbs, you know, almost all the way up to Wisconsin. You do, I know you do some stuff down in the city too, but a majority of your stuff is, is up in the northern suburbs. With yeah. kind of going back to the 50-50 show, have you ever run into anybody in those far out suburbs that it's like, whether it be audiences or the venue itself that you know you're booking a show at a bar or whatnot that have given you shit about the amount of women that you have on there or anything like have you ever run into anybody giving you a hard time about it i don't think so i don't think i don't think any venue or audience member or yeah. other comic <laughs> well i mean you know and then the other you know there were there could be other comics who you know there are guy comics who don't think women are funny you know so but no yeah. i've not i've not i've not gotten any pushback at all i uh, you know we try and book really strong lineups and that's what really even if a venue owner is like oh he's you know they see the promo and yeah <laughs> and there's a couple of women on there and they might be like oh they but you know but we we book really strong lineup so uh, that usually even if they had something in their head it's usually like you know what it was really fun like so yeah. it kind of wins them <laughs> over uh, i'm really you know i don't just book like anybody i, I there's a right. there's a process and i have a pipeline or i used to when we were able to book shows but i <laughs> uh, but I had a no, I had a I had a pipe. I, I had a particular show where the venue was really great and the and the owner was really uh, uh, supportive and that would always be my first show that I would book people um, before yeah. I brought them onto like uh, shows where people were paying more like dinner and shows where it might be like sixty bucks a head and stuff like that. Right. So, uh, <laughs> um, but but again, but I didn't just book anybody. They still had to submit. You know. Uh, yeah. Uh, to they, they'd still have to submit a video, uh, especially if I didn't know them, uh, to uh, uh, to to be considered for the show, and uh, and it would have to be good. You know, I did I didn't really like taking chances. So uh, the long story short is, regardless of what anyone might feel about, like oh, there's a there's too many women on the show, or it could be like a uh, you know, it could be a racist thing, like oh, right. why, why is he booking these black guys or whatever. Or, places where I go where they're not like in the Jews, you know, yeah. <laughs> but you know what, when everybody's strong, cause I'm a Jewish person. I mentioned that and I, I do shows in, in weird suburbs and sure. Wisconsin and stuff. <laughs> and they're not fans of Jews, you know, but we all have a good time. You know, it's, it's, it's all that matters. Yeah. yeah that's, as long as it's a good show, as long as it's funny. Uh, uh, there's uh, I did once at a show that I produced, I did get one uh, uh, from the side of the stage. I did get one solid, uh, Trump 2020 with a solid uh, Heil Hitler salute. Um, Fantastic. It was about a year, a year or so ago, I believe. Um, that was a little weird, but uh, yeah. and that was to me when I was on stage. But I, uh, I rolled with it. By rolling with it, I mean I, I just did not let up on those guys uh, until they. Um, I don't know if they left or they were asked to leave. I because I, I, I think the owner wasn't really happy about that. The venue yeah. owner wasn't. <laughs> Really happy about that. Um, so that uh, it's amazing that, how many people forget that you have a microphone too. Like, you're you're gonna win ninety nine percent of the time. Like, yeah, I, have I don't microphone. even know what I said. I was just kind of <laughs> relentless. I just got got on them so bad, and they just yeah. became the butt of. And they were just a tag to almost every joke at that point. You know. Yeah. So when when did you when did you book your first show? When did you start producing shows? And was it called? Was it always called Funnier by the Lake, or did you produce under something else before that? Uh, I produced under nothing for a little while. I just, I just, I was doing. Uh, I started doing comedy up in the North Burbs at this little venue uh, in Highwood, and they they had asked me to. Uh, they saw me perform, and then they had asked me to run a monthly show, which was sort of like a hybrid open mic. So it was sort of like an open mic. So it wasn't like a. It wasn't like a necessarily, but I would book it or I would invite people to come. But yeah. then it was, it was loose enough that like, if, if, if you showed up and asked for a spot, if we had a spot, I'd give you one, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I probably in 2014, after I'd started doing, doing regular shows. And then I think other venues 
I started picking up other venues uh, and then also doing comedy on my own, getting booked on my own and uh, for yeah. doing like cor uh, private stuff. Um, I just want, and I'm a branding person. That's my other company. I do branding, I do marketing. So yeah. to me, it was like, I, I, I want, and the first thing I thought of, cause I, I've grown up right on the, on the, I grew up on the lake in Wilmette and I lived away for a long time, but now I live again on, in Highland Park, which is right on the lake. And I grew up my entire life. I, uh, growing up there and even in the city, when you listen to the weather report, it's always just like, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be 75 degrees with uh, Northwest winds. Uh, and they'd always say cooler by the lake. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and so when I was, and then the first name I thought up was funnier by the lake and that's where it came from. So, uh, so funnier by the lake. If, so if anyone can't see, it's right, right behind me. That's yeah, right right. I'm, 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 I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, I'm in the tech booth of the, the beautiful 300 seat funnier by the lake theater in the, in the North Burks. <laughs> so story. One of the things uh, that I, I keep saying this because it's what I, it's one of the things I love is I love googling all these people that I already know and finding out. So uh, one of the things. So when you were talking about that place in Highwood, was that Billy Corgan's place, Madame Zuzu's? No, thing? that no. I would actually <laughs> I no. I I had been doing shows for a couple of years. Before um, no, he was his was in Highland Park. It was like right down the okay. street from my house, and uh, yeah, it was called Madame Zoo's. It was, it was a little uh, man, maybe like a maybe like a thousand square feet uh, tea house. Jesus. And, okay. Uh, there, there, you know, it was really mellow. It was great. He was really supportive, and he really liked the shows. And and uh, and like uh, uh, I was, I always used to say that there were two things that would pack that place. It yeah. would be funnier by the late comedy shows. And when he would do something, <laughs> of course, he, those were the two things that would that would pack that joint. Those were I, re, I did that show for almost three years. Uh, for a while, it was every other month, and then I did it. Then I bumped it up to every month, and uh, I did that for almost three years until the month that they that he closed it down. He's actually yeah. he has a new space he's working on opening. I don't know if that's going to happen. Obviously, everything's kind of yeah. changed, right? Well, uh, other than you and Billy Corgan, uh, my my favorite, uh, my other favorite Highland Park resident was uh, Harold Ramis. Did you ever uh, did you ever bump into him up there? Uh, first of all, I'm, aren't you a sports guy? I am a sports guy because you know that's Michael Jordan's house. It's still for sale, by the way, in Highland Park. Yeah, the, the big twenty three, the the big gate with the twenty three on it. I've driven by there before. Did they place, still have the twenty three? The place gate? is so nouveau riche trash. You know, give me a break. <laughs> that is like a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a estate built by a millionaire who did not grow up a millionaire. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's so audacious. <laughs> a it. <laughs> they can't sell it. They can't start. They've been trying to sell it for years. They, uh, his, is it you know, still they, him that owns it? Or no, well, his wife. Else? They got divorced. His wife, so his wife, right. And, you know, and they were selling it for like $23 million. I think the last time I checked, they were asking like $14 million or $15 million. It's, Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, nobody, it's, nobody just west of, it's just west of 41. And half day, yeah, it's, right? it's, like, yeah, it's on the west side. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, and then I also like right on that same... Neighborhood was Scotty Pippen's yeah. house too. He lived there too. But oh, oh did he? So you asked me about Harold Ramis. Harold Ramis. Yeah, because so. I know Harold. I ran into Harold Ramis up there a couple of times. I actually ran into him one time at a gas station. He was bringing out case after case of beer for like a party at his house or something. I was like, "Well, you need some help, man." He's like, "No, I got it." I'm like, "He okay. didn't live. Uh, he didn't live in Highland Park. He lived in Glencoe, which is one. Oh, okay, is one suburb south." Still, yeah. still right along the lake. So if you're just heading down south on Sheridan Road in Highland Park, you get past uh, Lake Kick Road, and you're you're in Glencoe at that point. Um, I know but, where um, Glencoe is because I asked my wife to marry me at Glencoe Beach. Oh, okay, cool. That's a really nice. Yeah. That's just got a nice overlook there. Um, yeah, it's really but nice. um, no. So so he lived in Glencoe, but his office was in Highland Park, and then I had an office for years that I just uh, closed uh, back in like October, I think. I just mm -hmm. got out of there like in October. I didn't need it anymore. And, uh, but his office was right down the hall for me. I mean, we're not talking oh, nice. a big office building. It was just the second floor above a restaurant. There was maybe like 10 offices and his was in the front. And then oh, right had, there by the train stop? No, 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 no. It, okay. it was by, it was actually across from the old uh, Highland Park movie theater. The okay. Old theater. All right. It was right yeah. across the street from there. Um, and, and so his office was, but he was gone. He had, just gotten out because he died he got he was sick right. so he was sick and he had got out there um uh, and he might have even died like right before i got in there 
And then I actually took some uh, furniture from his office and I had like a dust oh, yeah. from the office that I used, which I was very proud of. I just thought that, but he was just a, yeah, he was just sort of like a, he was very accessible. He was a really, he was just like a guy around town, you know, yeah. uh, he would just be at, at a restaurant. He would just be walking through town and uh, it was uh, no big deal. It was, it, it was. Yeah, yeah. He was very approachable. Like I only saw him like a couple of times and every time he was very approachable and, and easy going. So um, first, the first time I saw him in Highland Park, I was uh, with a, a, a friend slash client. We were just in downtown Highland Park. It was a nice day. I don't know what the hell we were doing. We were just standing on the corner. And uh, maybe one of us was going to drive away and we we're just standing there talking first. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, the guy, he's like, oh, that's Harold. Oh, there's Harold. Or, there's Harold Ramis. <laughs> and Harold was not well and he looked totally different. And I took yeah. one look at him. I was like, "That's not. That's not Harold Davis." And he's like, "No, I think it is." I'm like, "That." And and then I went and then I looked at some recent pictures. I'm like, "Oh, I guess it was. I, I hadn't seen him in a while. He was just he just gotten. He was starting to get very sick. So uh, yeah. I, I didn't. Uh, uh, I just didn't even recognize him, which was crazy. So one of the other thing I have to get to this real quick because this is just kind of funny to me. When you Google Larry Bloom. Okay. Do you know what the first non-paid thing that comes up is? The first non-paid result? Yep. Having to do with me or to somebody else? The name Larry Bloom. Just the name Larry Bloom. Uh, oh, uh, it might be uh, Orange is the New Black. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jason yeah. Biggs. I didn't know that was his character's name. In Orange I've the never New seen Black. that show. I've heard it's a very good show. This is how I learned that there was a character named Larry Bloom on that show. <laughs> I got, I, I set up Google alerts for certain things. So yeah. funnier by the lake and my other company's name, ATI creative consulting, if you're interested and uh, Larry Bloom. And, and I got out Google alert one day for Larry Bloom. And it was just the weird, it was like the, Oh, the, the, the Google alert was like to an article that was titled the internet is full of hate for Larry Bloom. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is that? I'm like, like, I know I piss people off, but is there some sort That's of like, great. is there some sort of like, uh, is there some sort of like movement about me yeah. that I'm not, and so I yeah. followed the link and then I, that's when I learned that, uh, and then there was like a blog called like, I hate Larry Bloom. Yeah, there was a blog there. There's also uh, an old- And he was like old... the least liked character on that show. He was the least exactly. liked character on a show <laughs> full of prisoners. And he wasn't a prisoner. <laughs> wasn't a prisoner. And everybody hate, and, and, and people who yeah. watched that show hated him. Yeah, I always, so I watched Orange is the New Black. And here's the thing that I will tell you about it. I don't know if you ever watched Weeds no. or not. No. So Weeds and Orange is the New Black is both done by uh, Gingy Cohen. Uh, I think that's her name. Yeah, but she can write three ep three seasons and then it's crap after that. And in my opinion, that's what she did with Weeds and then she did it again with Orange is the New Black. But there's also in Googling Larry Bloom that apparently there was a alderman that was corrupt as fuck. Maybe. No, no, no. You are wrong. <laughs> He was not corrupt as fuck. That's 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 where you're totally wrong. Actually, he was a very he was like the good guy alderman. He was in Hyde Park uh, for years. He was the alderman. I mean, yeah. he was a Jewish guy. Hyde Park was a very uh, 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 I think it was a black neighborhood or it was very mm -hmm. ethnic. So, but he was their alderman. Everyone loved him in the city. He was the guy that never got in trouble. He was the guy that people would when aldermen would be getting in trouble, they'd always point out Larry Bloom as this guy who just didn't didn't uh, break the rules. He, he was very yeah. ethical. And so basically um, what happened was they had this big years long investigation called silver shovel. Okay. That was, that was, that, so if you look up the silver shovel scandal, it had to do with, write um, that down. it had to do with, um, <laughs> there's a really great piece on NPR. I heard uh, not that long ago and they reran it recently. Someone explores the whole investigation about that and some of the key players, and uh, but it had to do with like illegal dumping of uh, of like construction material and asbestos and stuff like that, I believe. Uh, okay. Like these lot, these empty lots and these bad neighborhoods, and they were just dumping all this toxic shit and and just making people unhealthy. And it was all it was everybody, everybody was like on the take and whatever. Anyway, he got he right at the tail end of Silver Shovel. They indicted him. He had, uh, he had, uh, I think he had like uh, uh, committed some fraud, some tax fraud, tax or fraud. either yeah, for himself or his clients, whatever, yeah. something like that. So it wasn't like the biggest deal. And that was like, and I will tell you that I, 
that was back in, I'm going to say like 1997 or 1998. And I was living in the city and I ran a, a business. I was a, like a GM for this business for a, a division of Eastman Kodak. And I ran this little operation. I remember when I came in to my shop because we had a retail and then we had a photo lab yeah. and, my, and my offices. And then, and I came in and one of my employees, he's, he's holding up, must've been the Sun Times because the Tribune doesn't use font this big. It was like the biggest font I'd ever seen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was sort of like, you know, Dewey defeats Truman level, you know, yeah. gigantic. I still have the paper somewhere. And it just said, Bloom indicted. And he's just like, hey, check it out, Bloom indicted. And I was like, that's hysterical. You're fired. You can go now. <laughs> and, uh, but I was, I would get calls. People would look up Larry Bloom and his first name, uh, Lawrence, and we both had the same formal name too. And people would look him up in the city and I would get calls like on my uh, answer machine back then. It was kind of pre, pre voicemail, I think. Yeah. And it would be from people who were supporting him. Just be like, oh, we're just calling to say that you're a good guy. I don't, you know, I don't think you did anything <laughs> really wrong, whatever. And, and uh, I would get these messages like, to, like in support of the guy. Uh, That's like, hilarious. Yeah. So he wasn't, uh, yeah, he was not, uh, he was not corrupt as fuck at all especially in the city of chicago still indicted uh i don't know if he went to prison i think he may have gotten a sentence that didn't involve prison but um uh, regardless it said six still, months, but he probably didn't do it it was either suspended or it was uh something yeah. else but uh uh doesn't matter still an altar boy in chicago <laughs> comparatively yeah oh please comparatively, please yeah. please we, we like most of our governors become incarcerated I know, Please. right? Please. <laughs> um, so when I was reading over like some of the bio and stuff that you have um, on the Funnier by the Lake and whatnot, uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is uh, your degree in uh, sociology and fine arts. How does that turn into, I can see how that would turn into comedy, but how does that turn into marketing and consulting? Um, well, sociology has a lot to do with marketing, obviously, because it's the study of the behavior of groups uh sure so um that's actually but pretty fine art <laughs> well fine art is actually I, I i majored in both of fine art and sociology well i've always been a, an artist i've always been an artist uh, drawing and painting and then in, in college actually my, my concentration morphed into photography because i'm also a photographer as well um i do a ton of photography that's your favorite uh, media right photography is your favorite media yeah yeah and uh yeah. I hadn't even picked up a camera in, in two months until about a week or so ago. I actually broke out my good gear to go outside and take photos of stuff. Cause I take, I do all the photography at funnier by the lake shows and uh, even other uh, comedy shows people ask me to do. And I used to do other stuff, but this is really all I take uh, photos of. But so I, uh, yeah, I studied fine art and then uh, I also just had an interest in uh, sociology and, and uh, I didn't do much with, uh, Either I, you know what, I got a job after college that just uh, was just kind of a dumb job that just, I, I stuck to it and I just, I, I rose into management pretty quickly. And uh, then I was just, I just got into management and business development. And then I, I was good at it. And then when the company got purchased uh, uh, by a, a division of Eastman Kodak, I mean, they hired me to be the, the GM of the new business that they formed. Yeah. So um, that, so I, that, so that's how that worked. I wasn't so, but, but, as far, <laughs> but as far as fine art and sociology, when it comes to marketing and branding, those are actually two um, very compatible um, yeah. skills and degrees to have. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. The other thing that I noticed, uh, I used to say is, that sociology was the, uh, if a social sociology taught me nothing else, it's taught me that um, everybody can be pigeonholed. <laughs> I haven't thought, I used to say that. I haven't said that in years, but I used to say yeah, that all the time. Everyone could be pigeonholed. That was my conclusion. Everybody, every every person, every group of person, every segment, you know, uh, you know, uh, everyone could be pigeonholed, profiled, whatever. However, however, you know, if you're going to market to people, that's how it works. That's yeah, how it works. nice. Yeah, the other thing that I noticed when reading uh, your bio was um, you had made a comparison to Hawkeye from MASH. So my question for you is more, not about the comparison, but what is better? Which did you like more, the movie or the series? Oh, well, 
God, MASH the movie was my favorite movie for when I was a kid for a very long time. Yeah. I, I've seen that movie hundreds of times. Now, I will say, it's not that I made a comparison. It's just like, that was my mod. Like I wished Your mom, I had, yeah. that was, I wished I had the, the, the wit, obviously, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a fictional character. That's why he always has the right thing to say. But like to be able to come in and, and just have the, the witty thing to say, the witty comeback, the, the, the way to, to, to flip something around and make it funny and just always be super smart and super funny. I mean, that, that's, that's why he was my favorite character. That's why I just wanted to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, okay. You know what? Um, Donald Sutherland as Hawkeye and Alan Alda as Hawkeye are two completely different characters. Two totally different characters. I, think, totally, I mean, the same character would play totally. No, they're, to, they're totally approached. Uh, Alan Alda, way in, in the series, especially in the early years before they started taking themselves way too seriously, um, like most sitcoms. Um, right. Uh, Alan Alda, way more slapsticky, way more slapsticky. Right. Uh, in fact, there were so many, there were times when he'd be walking around in a Groucho glasses and nose and stuff, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, that it was more slapsticky. It was more quick, uh, quick uh, punchline or set up a punchline or quick quip, that kind of stuff. Right. The movie, it was a heavier movie. It actually wasn't even a comedy necessarily. So it, no, it was definitely. I, I so mean, the characters well, were. I, I mean, the characters were more dark and brooding. Even the funny ones right. were, were, it was more brooding. So. Yeah, I remember. So like, I I'm I'm a, I'm a little younger than you, and so I remember watching the series, and the series had a big impact on me. Like, like my family really loved. Um, really loved that show, and yeah. I I enjoyed watching it. CBS. But when I got lot. old. Yeah, when I got old enough to go back and watch the movie, I think the movie stuck with me more than the series did, though. You know, especially like as an adult, it's so crazy when you when you get older and you go back and you watch things. And this is obviously, good. I mean, I think you're ten years older than me, maybe. Um, I'm gonna be fifty three. Oh, so you're eight years older. I'll be fifty three, so, ladies. <laughs> lady yeah, no. single Larry I'm no, single Larry. I'm no goof I'm no goofy kid <laughs> but, so like Ish. I remember watching so I like one of the first things that, that like the weirdest things to me is I remember watching Revenge of the Nerds when I was a kid and thinking that was the funniest shit and then I got a little bit older and I watched it and I was like oh my god they're smoking weed in that and then I, I thought it was great and then I watched it again a little bit later and I'm like that's great like the it's guy, a little rapey. <laughs> the guy, the guy who um, wrote um, the Revenge of the Nerds uh, franchise, yeah, lives in Highland Park. Lives in Highland Park. He really? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. I ran into him at Starbucks. Wow. And I actually wow. didn't even meet him at first. I overheard him talk. He was pitching something to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's funny like when you go back and you watch that nut. oh yeah the, the the you know the 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 big thing at the end is uh, essentially he he rapes the cheerleader or the sorority girl right exactly right because he like, had sex with her uh, uh i mean technically uh she thought he was somebody else he knew right. she thought he was somebody else and he had sex with her yeah there's a lot yeah. of uh what else was i just watching that was uh oh man I'm, not, I'm gonna guess it was a John Hughes movie. No, if you go um, back and you look at his movies. <laughs> no, what was the movie? No, no, actually, no. They they weren't those. I don't care what anybody says. They weren't rapey. That's for sure. Well, no, so, they weren't rapey. They weren't rapey. There was definitely a lot of inappropriateness, though. What the hell movie was I watching? Uh, oh man, I, and I remember posting on Facebook. I was like, whatever movie doesn't hold up. And then a friend of mine from downstate said, also kind of rapey. And I said, you know what? I was almost gonna use that word. <laughs> I wish I could remember. Um, oh, oh, Saturday Night Fever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because there's oh, some shit. casual attempt to yeah. rape in that movie, yeah. uh, that everyone just kind of, even the woman, just kind of just rolls off and Damn. continues on. Yeah, yeah. Totally and it's pretty, and it's not, that. it's not funny at all. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, John Travolta's character that everybody loves. You know, Danny, yeah. right, or whatever his name is. Uh, uh yeah he like tries to rape that one girl who liked him like in the car right. she, has to, shit. she has to like fend him off man i gotta go back and watch that now yeah that's insane yeah all right Something well, that, some stuff they don't teach in scientology <laughs> that's right so uh it's been great talking with you i really appreciate it before we go uh we're gonna do a little segment we call uh ambush in here okay. our uh bunch of uh 
I don't say topics because they're written by eight and ten year olds. They're just this is words. recorded. If I really fail at this, just <laughs> edit <laughs> strategically so I don't come off looking like somebody who can't handle ambush questions from a seven year old. Okay. I have to make sure that I could. I just hope that they spelled things right. <laughs> okay. Are these questions or are these just words I'm supposed to react to? What? They're just words that we're going to react to and uh, go with. And look at okay. that. The first one they have is comedy that they put in there. Okay. Um, which, you know, we've been talking about. Let's, let's see. If I were to, let's see, comedy. The first thing that I think of when I think of comedy, like in, in that situation that we're having now, I think about to when I decided I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And I don't know when, you're, when you figured it out. I'll give you some time to think about it when I tell my story. I was 12 years old, my parents were divorced, my dad picked my brother and I up in Oklahoma and we were driving to Michigan. It's the middle of the fucking night. Everyone's supposed, you know, me and my brother are supposed to be asleep and my dad puts in Richard Pryor live on the Sunset Strip. Oh, he I thought remember, you guys were asleep? He thought we were asleep. And by the way, let cared. me just tell, hold on a second. Uh, I don't think that um, uh, kind of uh, seeding into your dream state unconscious is even any better than uh listening to it awake where you could maybe uh filter it and maybe ask what does that mean daddy instead you're yeah. just like asleep <laughs> and he's just talking about like you know eating pussy and shit like that yeah <laughs> but I, re I remember at that moment like i want to do that <laughs> like that's that's great so uh do so you, that what you do you, that what you're do you ever remember me? yeah do you ever have do you remember having a moment where you're like I know that's what I want to do. Like you were watching somebody, you heard somebody or anything like that, or, or is it, was it just kind of a slow process that all of a sudden one day you were like, yeah, this is me, what I did. Well, I didn't, I didn't start doing stand up comedy until very late. So probably only, you know, less than 10 years ago, uh, I was doing some other stuff, but, um, before that, but when I was young, yes, I had a great reverence for stand up comedy. I, I basically studied it my entire life. So and that's when people would always be like, oh, you should be a stand-up comedian. And I'd be like, well, it's easy to say, but I, I, I know how I was such a student of it. I just knew how, it, how difficult it was. And so, I, so I, when I was younger, I really had a reverence for it. And, um, and then when I was older, like high school, college, when a lot of people would start doing it, I just did not have the self-esteem or the personality yeah. to um, – to get on stage and uh, and I don't know if the opportunity and we're not and never even talked about it when people would bring it up like you should be a comedian whatever I just whatever I just and I and also I I was living a life where if I got into comedy at that age um with everything that you know which would have then at that point would have been like the mid to late 80s to early 90s um uh if I got into that lifestyle I would just be dead because I was already living a very crazy <laughs> like. <laughs> life of consumption so uh, yeah. I, yeah, so it's kind of a blessing that I didn't have the the opportunity or the gumption to do that. Um, and, so let me uh, ask you this: since you were a fan of it when you were younger, so let's let's go mid mid seventies. But mid I will tell you, I will tell you that I do remember as a, like in grade school and junior high, like I used to, I was like the 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 class smartass, you know. And I, yeah. you go, you look at my, I think in my junior high yearbooks, I when they officially vote you as something, like I was like. Yeah. The, you know, vote as the funniest person or best, you know, best joker or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I, everyone writing in my thing is like, you're the funniest person I know. And so, <laughs> but, uh, and, and I remember there was a kid and he's very successful in Hollywood right now. I mean, not like a household name, mm -hmm. but if, but he's a big producer, director of things you've seen. I'm not going to say his name, uh, sure. but uh, he's very successful. And um and uh, he used to come in to class like he would have watched like a Robin Williams or an Eddie Murphy special the night before. Yeah. And he would come in and he would be doing that. He would be like recreating it because uh, mm -hmm. he was an actor at first, you know, before he yeah. uh, went to the behind the scenes and uh, as an adult. And uh, and uh, I used to get so mad that he was just doing somebody else's. Yeah. Even as like a little kid at yeah, junior high, I'd be like, "Hey, right. I'm like, hey. I'm writing material here. I'm writing, I'm writing jokes. 
about I'm working over here. I'm writing Ayatollah jokes here. You're just coming in <laughs> and doing Robin Williams jokes about what if the elbow was as sexy as the tit, you know, you know <laughs> talk about Mr. Happy. Come on. Yeah, come on. Man. Get your now own stuff. <laughs> now he's a, uh, yeah, now he's extremely, I guess he was right though, because he's extremely successful in Hollywood, which is difficult. Yeah. All right, let's do one more before we get out of here real quick. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> staying on time. Uh, I don't. Staying on as time. A, as a producer, staying on time, how, how big of a deal is that to you? Staying on time? Well, just in, in general, um, <clears throat> You know, I, I always joke, but it's pretty much true that the, uh, the only piece of advice that my dad gave me that I actually took <laughs> mm -hmm. um, was he, like when I was in high school and I had to get to work, like in my job at, the rest, at a restaurant, you know, he's like, don't you have to go to work? I'm like, oh, I don't have to be there till four. He's like, well, and it'd be, it was like 3.45 or something like that or 10 minutes to or whatever. Yeah. And he's like, no, you should be there. You should always arrive 15 minutes early. And I fought him on that that day. But also from that day, I have adhered to that. Mm -hmm. Always be early. And till the day he died, I never admitted that he was right and that I had spent my entire <laughs> life adhering to being 15 minutes late. I mean, 15 minutes early means on time to me. And so yeah. to me, so just to segue that to actually answer your question, uh, yeah, time obviously in comedy is really important, whether you're the producer or the performer. And uh, uh, I don't. And so, um, I, you know, I like, I like. I'm very conscious of when a show is scheduled for, to when it starts, to how long it goes, and then also the people who I have booked uh, that they uh, stick to the time. So yeah. um, doesn't matter how well you're doing, you know, if we've given you 12 minutes and you, and you just keep going and going. Um, you know, I'm not going to make a scene, but I'm also not going to book you again. <laughs> it's, not, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> you know, uh, it's just not going to happen. And because uh, it's very disruptive, it's disrespectful to me and the other comedians and oh, the yeah. venue. So time, super important. And uh, I did, I don't know if we talked about this, but um, one of the skills that I, you know, if you, there's that, there's like the show at, in Zanies at Rosemont, which is like the, it's like an audition show and they give you six yeah. minutes and you know what? They want you to be funny, but when they come in there and they talk to everybody on the lineup in the green room, they, that's what they hammer. They say, stick to the light. Don't go short. Yeah. Don't go long. Stick to the light. We're going to give you the light at a minute. And then the second time you see that light, it's your name and thank you very much. And you, and you get off. And, uh, and that actually yeah. doing those shows helped me just build this skill of, uh, editing while talking because knowing that, Oh, you know what? I got the light. I have a minute left or I know I've got yeah. two minutes left and like, I want to do this bit, but it's going to take too long. And then you edit while you're talking, you edit and you shorten it yeah. sticking to the light. Yeah. And, uh, and the last time I did that show, um, I literally like I have a recording of it and it went six minutes and 10 seconds. And that's including the, uh, thanks a lot. Zanies. Uh, see you later. Yeah. And so I'm very, uh, I don't think I ever went over at that show. And, uh, I, I, I think it was when Cindy was still there. I think she was the one who told me that she was like, you know, it's six minutes. Um, if you get a laugh at five and a half, tip your hat, and get off the fucking stage. <laughs> like you don't need, to, we, we don't need that other 30 seconds. You know, you're not going to do another 30 seconds. You're going to do 45. You're going to go over. If you're at that spot, finish it and go. You know, it's, you know, you don't want to finish five minutes early by any means on any type of show, but you know, something well, like that, like if well, you're there, you know, tie it up and go. Well, what I learned from doing those shows and some other like club shows, which were time was really the, the, the in essence, you know, uh, I, uh, um, I did, I just, um, I, I learned as a, as a, as a producer, how I just, when I produce, it's just how, how important it is. Uh, you know, when I, when they give you six minutes or another place gives you 10 minutes or you do a funnier by Lake show and I'm giving you 10, you know, or we're like, if it's one of my, 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 the show that I, my pipeline show that I, I book everyone first. It's like, when I say we give you 10 minutes, uh, when you do that, right. That, that tells me that like you can do 10 minutes, which means when I give you 10 minutes, you're not going to do six and a half. 
and you're not going to do 15 minutes. Right. You know, that's what gets, so that's why like those shows, which are sort of audition shows, uh, that's what they want to see because they want to know, Hey, we gave them six minutes. They did six minutes. So in the future, if we're going to give them a feature spot, 25 minutes, half an hour or, 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 you know, 15 minutes, whatever, that they're going to do that, that they know this is the yeah. time and they stick to it. And then I really brought that into producing as well. Uh, I don't make it, uh, I don't sit everybody down and be like, look, everyone stick to the time. I do, I do say, you know, mind the light, you know, don't go long. Right. And if we keep flashing, you, you got to get off. Um, and well, you expect a certain professionalism out of anybody that you book, like you shouldn't have to beat it, beat it into somebody that, you know, you have to be off at 10 minutes. Hey, I told you you're doing 10 minutes. You're going to get a light at eight. You're going to get a light at nine. Be professional and know that you got to be off at 10. And some people that some people even, even pros and some people, because they're pros, um, don't really respect that. You can get away with it a little bit if you're the closer or the headliner, but if you're like second in a lineup of four or five people and you've now just, you know, and it's like a, an hour show or a, a 90 minute show, whatever the case may be, you've just screwed it up because, you know, a lot of times yeah. with venues, uh, if, especially if you're renting the space, you have X amount of time. If somebody goes, five minutes long or 10 minutes long that you might have to take somebody off of the lineup or tell your headliner, Oh, you can't do 45. You can only do a half an hour. That's, that's how right. important it is. And a lot of people um, don't really, uh, obviously the audience doesn't uh, realize at all. And some people who are actually performing don't respect. And that's uh, I just, it doesn't matter how funny you are. Uh, I just, and there's people, you know, I have co-producers and there's just people I'm just like, I'm not booking this person anymore. Yeah, they cancel too many. They cancel too many times, or they run the light, or they uh, or they just get up early for no reason, and then and people yeah. have to scramble. And but by the way, not just the host, if whether it's me, or the host, but there's also somebody waiting in the wings to go next. And you know, your head is you just want like, you're calibrated to you're calibrated to. Um, I'm going up in five minutes. Yeah, you're thinking things through. And you're looking and you're, and you're gauging the responses and you're processing all that. And then all of a sudden somebody gets up early and like, oh, you're going up now. It, it's just a, a, a domino effect of, of, of a needless domino effect of, of chaos and disruption. You, you want to, th this story will probably drive you batty. And it, it pissed me off really bad. I won't name the venue or producer or anything, but I was doing a show. Was it one of my shows? No, it was not. <laughs> all right, then go ahead. So I, I get there. And they're like, hey, uh, we're going to have you close out the show because it was one of those ones where I didn't know what the order was. I was just booked on the show. And I get there and they're like, we're going to have you close out the show. And I'm like, great. And they're like, what you do 25 minutes? I'm like, okay, great. So a couple of people go over. One guy goes over really far. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I'm going up. They haven't said shit to me. The last thing that I was told is I'm doing 25 minutes. And I'm like, great, this will be a good time for me to work this set out i'm going to record it because there's somebody there that was recording everything and then i was like this is going to be perfect for me i'm going to i'm going to work this out uh i've been i haven't done a 25 minute set in a while it'll be great i get a light at 17 minutes and i'm like uh what's going on and they're like you gotta you know like they, they flash me again and i'm like all right so i just i finish up i, I got the light i knew i had a minute and so i finished up and the, the MC wasn't back there because he knew that I was supposed to be doing 25 minutes. Uh, the producer the, had to finish on time. Oh, the producer. Uh, the producer. The, <laughs> the producer gave me, he took my time from all of the other people that had gone over, but didn't tell the MC or me that he had taken their time. So I just had to basically, you know, finish up and go because they, like you said, they had to be out of the, they had to be out of the venue. Like, that's fucked up, man. Like, you couldn't tell me, like, hey, now you're going to do 18 or whatever. I mean, to cut somebody seven minutes, eight minutes without telling them is a big chunk to just throw at somebody and not even let the MC know who's the guy who's running the whole thing. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't make, uh, it doesn't make, there's almost, it's very hard to avoid in that situation where you would just be like, uh, what? Uh, okay, okay, I guess I'm not, like, you know, you just realize, yeah. don't have time for all the rest of what I was going to say. Oh, I guess that's it for me. That's it's a it's not a good way you want to go out, you know. It's not a good way that I wanted to go out, especially when I was trying to get this nice twenty minute set that you know, because sometimes bookers when you're going for longer sets want to see a twenty minute set. 
Yeah. So I'm like, this is what I'm thinking, but I don't. Don't ever send me a 20 minute clip. Okay? I will <laughs> never send you a 20 minute clip. I, 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 oh. my, my criteria for the in my submission form is uh, uh, send a, a, a clip that's uh, at least eight minutes or about about eight minutes, and uh, yeah. I and uh, which is kind of long. I don't unless it's really good. I don't watch all eight minutes of it. Um, part of that is uh, I just want to have people who have done enough that they have an actual like eight or 10 minute uh, video instead of just uh, all they've got are sh short ones, which are kind of crappy. And I also want to know that I want to see like an eight or nine minute clip. So that, cause a lot of my, some of my shows, like the, the guest spots and feature spots are like 10, 15 minutes. So <laughs> I want to, I don't, I don't want to just be like, well, I saw a five minute clip. Hopefully they, hopefully they can do 12. The other minutes. 10 won't suck. <laughs> uh, and then the other reason I do that is some people will be like, Oh, you know what? I don't have like a, I don't have anything current that's like eight minutes long. I've got some shorter ones. I'm like, look, I know you. You're funny. Just send whatever. It's okay. I was like, right. oh, you know what? I do that just to just to self filter, so I don't get a lot of uh, uh, amateur garbage. <laughs> There's a lot of that. <laughs> well, speaking of time, I think that's probably a good spot to finish it up. Okay. Um, before before we get out of here, uh, you want to run down any of your credentials again, any of your social stuff where people can find you uh, and, and anything that's going on? I can do that. Um, okay, well, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Larry Bloom, funnier by the late comedy in Highland Park, Illinois. We pr produce a lot of live comedy shows, dinners and shows, straight up comedy showcases, um, private events, uh, uh, comedy services for businesses like writing and presentations and uh, uh, auctioneering, uh, meeting facilitation, uh, all things where we can inject comedy. Uh, you can find all that out at funnierbythelake.com and follow Funnier by the Lake on Instagram and Facebook. You just go look up Funnier by the Lake. It's the only one that'll come up. And then you're doing a uh, nightly show right now as well with different comedians. It's about an hour long. What are you calling that? The, the, the pandemic oh, yeah. 2020 or something? Well, yeah, we, we, right now, uh, while we are searching for something to do like a comedy show or storytelling show on uh, Facebook Live via this Zoom type format. Uh, but for, for the time being, we're doing uh, almost every night uh, interview shows. I do call it the 2020 pandemic interview show. I specify 2020 because of course there will be a 2021 and 2022 <laughs> pandemic. So I, I'm just, I, I'm a branding right. person. So I, I wanted to be accurate. Uh, and so each, each one of those, it's, a, it's usually at 7.30 um, uh, each evening. Uh, you can find it on the Funnier by the Lake Facebook page. It goes Funnier by the, uh, it goes uh, Facebook Live. Um, each evening, each evening about seven thirty. Tomorrow, actually, we're doing it at seven o'clock. Though so I know you're pre-recording this, that means nothing. Tomorrow doesn't mean anything. <laughs> uh, but and then and what we do is we interview primarily creative people, so comedians, actors, producers, writers, poets, um, some uh, uh, venue owners, uh, some business people, some friends, uh, really just to give them a platform. Because as performers, we're all kind of existing in a vacuum unless we do something like this, do something online. Just give them a platform to talk about uh, where they came from, what they're doing, what they were doing in the past, what they're doing now, and what we will all hopefully be doing in the future. And also let them get, uh, you know, if they've got social media, they've got websites, they've got merchandise, they've got albums. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 want, I want to, uh, uh, a big part of Funnier by the Lake is giving, is giving a stage to people, um, uh, you know, uh, professional comedians, uh, up and coming pin comedians. So we're kind of doing the same thing via this uh, interview show. Yeah, well, I, uh, I appreciate you coming on tonight because I know you were just talking with uh, Johnny Diaz tonight for an hour. So I'm sure you're probably a little talked out. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm, living, I'm alone here in isolation in my house. So uh, I talked to my dog all day. And uh, so uh, actually spending two hours talking to uh, uh, humans is, uh, believe it or not, uh, no, on a normal day uh, outside a pandemic, a full work day. Sometimes I come home and I, I got to do a show or something like that. And I mean, I, I, I'll realize like, man, I've been talking for hours on end. And I'll be, <laughs> will hurt. I'll be exhausted yeah. from hearing my own voice and thinking. This is actually a little, little treat. So Nice. Well, Larry, thanks for uh, hanging out with us for a little bit. Um, you can find everything out uh, that you need for uh, All Talk uh, with me, Mike All, at MikeAll.com. Uh, once again, Larry, thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk soon, I'm sure. All right. Thanks, Mike. See you later. Thanks. Bye.